If you've been to the gift shop at a science museum, you've probably seen one of these. This is a Crookes radiometer, and it works like this. If we shine light on it, the radiometer starts to spin, and the brighter the light, the quicker it spins. But what actually makes it spin? You might be tempted to think that it has something to do with the photons themselves. So the photons that are emitted by the light bulb hit the radiometer, and it's actually the momentum of the photons that cause it to spin. However, look more closely. As you can see, it's actually the black face that's trailing, meaning that there's more force on the black face than there is on the white face of the radiometer veins. Now, if we think about the photons coming out of here, they would actually be reflected off the white sides and absorbed on the black sides. So that would mean that they're actually delivering more force to the white faces, and it would cause it to spin the other way. So the explanation that light pressure causes this radiometer to spin is actually completely wrong. It would spin the other way if it were true. Now there is such a thing as light pressure. Uh, it's a very, very small effect. Uh, something like a 50 watt laser produces maybe about 17 micrograms force of pressure of force on, on a vein like this. And the amount of force that's being generated inside there is actually much higher that causes it to spin. So there must be some other explanation for its movement. So let's try something else. I've let the radiometer come to rest by itself, and I'm going to spray some of this on it. This is a canned air duster, which is actually a refrigerant. And what I'm going to do is tip it upside down and spray some of the refrigerant on the glass envelope of the radiometer. And as you can see, it's actually spinning backwards relative to the way that it was spinning when we shined the light bulb on it. So clearly there is something else going on here. If it were just a photon effect, making the glass envelope cold would not cause it to spin backwards because we aren't pulling photons out that way. As you might have guessed, the effect is thermal and it does require that there be some gas in the radiometer envelope. If there were no gas at all inside here, then the only thing that could touch the rotor and make it spin would be the photons shining on it. And we've determined that can't be right because the photons would be making it spin the other way. Uh, we also know that it doesn't work if we're just at ambient pressure. So if we just broke this glass envelope and shined light on this, it wouldn't spin. Uh, the gift stores would be unhappy because they wouldn't be able to sell you this neat little glass envelope. So that means that there must be some ideal pressure at which the thing works really well. It can't be zero, and it can't be ambient pressure. So I've set up my vacuum chamber here with a vacuum gauge, and a radiometer. I actually broke one of these open and took the rotor out and set it up on a pin inside there. And I have a tachometer set up so we can measure how fast the radiometer is spinning. And we can also adjust the pressure in the chamber to figure out what the ideal pressure is to get it to spin the fastest. And this will give us another clue as to the mechanism that actually makes it spin. This vacuum chamber has two vacuum pumps, a mechanical pump and a turbomolecular pump, to bring the pressures down to very low levels. Both vacuum pumps are now running, and I've pulled out as much air as I can from the chamber. So now I'm going to turn on this directional spotlight. And as you can see, nothing's happening. The rotor is not spinning. And you might be saying, well, it's just because the light level isn't high enough. But I, from uh, previously playing with this, I know that this level of light is more than enough to make it spin. Uh, the fact is that there's just so few gas molecules in the vacuum chamber that we don't get this thermal effect, and there's nothing to make the rotor spin. Now I'm going to raise the chamber pressure slowly by opening an electronic valve. As you can see, it's now spinning. I can measure the exact rotational speed with the optical tachometer that's inside the vacuum chamber and get the readout from the oscilloscope here. And also the voltage uh, listed here is the vacuum level, and it's also displayed on this panel. This voltage just corresponds to a vacuum level that's based on the output of this specific sensor. And what I'm going to do is take a bunch of data, uh, raise the chamber pressure slowly, and then record the speed that I get for each pressure. Okay, we now have our data, and just as we suspected, the radiometer doesn't spin at very low pressures, and it doesn't spin at very high pressures, but there's this perfect balance point, which in this case corresponds to about seven millitor. 
and that means that a gas molecule travels about one centimeter before hitting another gas molecule, just to give you an idea of how dense the environment is inside the chamber. Uh, for comparison, at ambient pressures, uh, I think the distance is about 100 nanometers, so quite a bit less dense than ambient pressure. So what makes it actually spin? Well, there's two uh, contributing factors. One is that when a gas molecule comes in and hits one of the black faces, it recoils with a bit more energy because the black face is hotter than the white face. There's another effect called thermal transpiration, which just means that there's a pressure differential set up by the hot face and the cooler face. But it's a thermal effect, so one side of the face is a little bit hotter than the other, and it causes these things to happen. However, what's interesting is that both the, uh, the thermal recoil and the thermal transpiration uh, effect only occurs at the edge of the veins. And, coincidentally, the veins are about one centimeter on an edge, just like the mean path length that corresponds to 7 millitor there. So I'm not sure if that's a coincidence, but it seems quite interesting, and I'm very tempted to make a radiometer with larger veins and see if its optimal pressure is lower. Okay, see you next time. Bye.